Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Heritage Trust of Nova Scotia program series uh, for May 2022. Some of us are joining, some of you will be joining us this evening uh, virtually, and others may be seeing this later. But this is a timeless topic, and we're lucky to have with us Holly Haynes, who is a young Nova Scotia historian. And no, that's not a contradiction in terms. And uh, Holly graduated only in 2020 from Dalhousie, but she has spent years and years uh, with a long fascination with the industrial history and the material culture of uh, the part of the province where she grew up, which is East Hants. Um, she's done work on cemeteries. Uh, her thesis was on advertising. Uh, she's done work on uh, advertising of chocolate in the 19th, in 19th century Nova Scotia. And she's also done a lot of work on the railways, which ran through East Hants during the uh, during the 19th century. We've been focusing uh, on, an, I guess it's more of an occasional series now, but we have been talking about the infrastructure that was needed to develop the built heritage of our province. And certainly transportation was a very important part of that. However, even infrastructure goes wrong at times, and uh, Holly is here to tell us about one of the more spectacular examples of that, um, which is the, uh, the long struggle to construct a railway bridge over the Shubenacadie, which had, of course, been initially planned for use as the Shubenacadie Canal across the province. So um, this session is being recorded. And uh, if you have any questions uh, while Holly is talking, the best thing is probably just to type them into the chat function and we uh, will have a question and answer session afterwards. So uh, with all that, turn it over to you, Holly. Great, thank you. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm really, really happy to see uh, some familiar names in the screens. Um, I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you. Uh, I have kind of, prepared a little bit about myself as well. Um, so some of you know me quite well, and some of you only maybe in the last year since I've joined the board. Um, but I'd like to kind of start maybe a little bit about how this kind of heritage of the province first started to appeal to me. So some of you might be familiar with the Heritage Fair program. And what the Heritage Fair program is, is essentially it's a program designed for students from grades four to grades nine to pick a Canadian heritage project research it, and then present it in front of a panel of judges. And a lot of these judges actually happen to be members of groups like East Hans Historical or Heritage Trust. Um, and I'm thankful that I've got to meet a lot of you folks um, through this fair program, um, which has kind of kindred my love and continued into some of the topics you're gonna hear me speak about tonight. Um, Science Fair wasn't really my cup of tea, um, but unfortunately it was offered opposite Heritage Fair on alternating years. And so you had to do science fair. And I somehow managed to make heritage fit into science um, when it came actually to this bridge accent that I'm gonna speak a lot about today um, by drilling holes in pop bottles and putting them <laughs> into a fish tank to see how fast water would come in a pier. Um, so I guess you could kind of say that even though my love for science and mathematics and physics and engineering, um, has kind of always been disguised with the love of history. And that led very, very easily into my work in various museums. So on the screen, you'll see uh, the Weaverly Heritage Museum in the top corner. I spent quite a bit of time there uh, for the first two years, actually, of my heritage work. The bottom corner, you'll see the Lower Selma uh, Heritage Museum and uh, Land Cemetery, which <laughs> is more fitting for me, I guess. Um, I've spent a lot more time, actually, in the cemeteries of East Hants doing the documenting of those. Um, but I also was a guide um, at the Selma Museum for a summer as well. That saw me then shift into records management with East Hans Municipality, um, which will have relevance later. The cemetery project's been an ongoing love. Um, I'm not sure if you guys caught the CBC article that uh, appeared yesterday or the clip on the news last night, um, but this has kind of been an ongoing love and has been simultaneously happening uh, with my work at Dow. Um, and my work at Dell in terms of a student and also now my work as a teaching assistant. So part of this lecture has actually been modified from a guest lecture I gave uh, in an engineering ethics course, uh, which is actually required by all uh, Dell engineering grads. And now, obviously, it's my first year as a board member of Heritage Trust, although I have uh, written uh, for the Griffin on two different occasions on heritage structures, heritage churches um, in East Hans. 
trying to click. <laughs> All right, so for those of you who are familiar with most of the province, you probably know where South Maitland is, but this is really important just to kind of geographically put it on a map for all of you and to point out two very important locations, Truro and Windsor. So Truro and Windsor were actually the two kind of hubs for the Midland Railway line. The Midland Railway ran from 1901 until the 1980s, and there were several options really for uh, the connection in South Maitland and actually where the line was going to run. And I'll talk about those here in a minute. So Truro and Windsor, they both had already existing railway lines coming into them that connected to the rest of the province at this point. However, the proposed railway line in Shubenac and in, in, at the Shubenacadie River in South Maitland had two alternatives. It could either go across the bridge or it could avoid the bridge, which seems kind of ironic um, now knowing obviously what the cost of life and dollars were to bridge the Shubenacadie River but you could have actually gone from in, into the community of South Maitland and bypassed it completely, connected to the rail in Stewiak and not had to build the bridge. Or you could have built the bridge, gone into Brookfield, saved cost on the actual construction of the line because there was already a line in the Brookfield area. But instead, <laughs> uh, the line crossed the Shubenacadie River and then proceeded into the district of Clifton, which gave $4,000 at the time uh, to aid in this decision. And uh, it was quite costly because they had to build the line the whole way into Truro. So it ended up being 57.84 miles of track. And it was a small rural railway line that was built by wealthy shareholders, local businessmen, with a significant influence from Montreal. Actually, about half the shareholders in the Midland Railway Company were from Montreal originally, um, which will play into maybe some ethical implications a little bit later. The construction of the line began in 1898, and the South Maitland Railway Bridge was the last component completed on the line, which was completed in 1901. Now, there were several accidents in the construction of this line. Um, the bridge was not the only site for those, unfortunately. Um, one accident happened in Brooklyn when two men uh, were actually crushed by a ballast train uh, while in the actual construction of the line there. One was Eddie Salter, who was from Brooklyn. And it came aside with the human cost of life, um, it came with quite a dollar sign associated with the construction here as well. Um, 1.75 million in 1899, which is over 55 million in today's standards. So it was quite a costly endeavor um, and it required a lot of uh, financial donations from different districts. I mentioned Clifton earlier, um, but also uh, the shareholders who had other interests uh, such as lumber yards, um, and other kind of shipping and community interests. The railway bridge construction cost alone um, was over $100,000 estimated for just the piers. Um, and I'll talk about those estimates later, they were incorrect, <laughs> um, which is, shouldn't be a huge shock, uh, but unfortunately uh, did jack the price up in terms of what the line cost to complete. The Truro Daily News and the 28th of July in 1899 quoted, the Midland, when completed, will probably be the best built railway in the lower provinces. The culverts and substructure of all the bridges being of stone and the grades and curves of the most favorable kind for fast and safe running. So it was always reflected in very positive terms. And I do wanna highlight just quickly before I, I change slides, um, two of these wealthy shareholders. Um, so one was Alfred Putnam, who was from the Maitland area, a uh, very prominent uh, politician. And the other was Thomas Gotobed McMullen. I'm not kidding, Gotobed is actually his middle name, um, who was also a political representative from the Truro area. So the bridge construction, um, I have mentioned that that was the last component that was completed, but it started May 1st, 1899 with the New York Engineering Contract Company contracted to complete the piers and the Dominion Bridge Company of Quebec, Montreal, to complete the spans. Um, George E. Thomas, who was the head engineer of the Engineering Contract Company has actually pu uh, published a report just after the piers were completed, um, which you can access at that kind of URL. I will make these slides available through email later on. Um, and I will discuss kind of this article in quite a bit of detail. Um, it maybe speaks a little bit to the ethical implications um, that he faced at this particular site. William Stryker, who was the manager of the Dominion Bridge Company. Um, the spans were relatively uneventful in comparison to the peers, um, but I will talk with them later as well. 
The length of the bridge was 1,240 feet and employed approximately 300 people at a given time. And we can see obviously the cost of constructing the bridge was quite hefty and the engineering fees alone were over $5,000. All right, so the Bay of Fundy Tides and Materials. So many of us are familiar being from Nova Scotia with the Bay of Fundy Tides. They have broken tidal power equipment. They are quite strong. Um, this was something that well anticipated and different things kind of were working around trying help to help this construction go through successfully. There were significant challenges. Um, having it be the highest observed record tides in the world the tide was really, really important for things like shipping. The South Maitland area at this time was a very, very remote location and mainly accessible by like a wagon road and the tide. But everything being dependent on the tide then meant that you were dependent on the tide schedule, which is a 6.29 oscillation period. Um, the role of shipping in the Maitland community was obviously pretty prominent uh, for Heritage Trust built heritage folks. I've included uh, the Lawrence House Museum image. Um, W.D. Lawrence building the largest wind vessel in Canada being from the Maitland area. Lawrence was also a political rival to Alfred Putnam. Um, I'll share a little story just because I think it's cute. Um, Roy Rhino, who uh, unfortunately has since passed away, lived in the home that Alfred Putnam had constructed for himself, also in nearby Maitland. Um, he bragged in, I believe it was probably 2012, um, to me that the Putnam House was exactly one inch longer and one inch wider than the Lawrence House. So while W.D. Lawrence might have had the bigger boat, Alfred Putnam had the bigger house. So there was quite a rival going on between these men, and uh, Putnam was the only shareholder uh, from that area to invest in the Midland Railway. Because of this remote location, it also made material shipping to that location really, really challenging. For example, the cement was mixed on the Windsor side by hand, but the cement powder came from England. So in order to get that cement powder successfully to the bridge site, it had to go from England to Halifax by steamer, Halifax to Stuyak by rail, and then from Stuyak to South Maitland on the tide while waiting for the tide to cooperate. <laughs> So it was quite a challenge and other materials such as sand was brought in from five islands, gravel came from the Debert Beach, coal came from Parsboro, and even fresh water was brought in from over two miles away. So this was quite an accomplishment just to get the materials to make this bridge and have these adequate supplies to the actual site itself. The cable way. <laughs> um, this is the first structure built at the bridge site and it probably should have been their first red flag. I say this because several times while trying to construct the cableway, they would get about two thirds of the way across the bay and the tide would go out and the tide would be stranded and there'd be no cable strung. So essentially what this cableway was for was to transport supplies and men across the Bay of Fundy. The cable itself weighed about 12 tons and it was 1400 feet long and they were connected by 74 feet foot high towers on each side. Um, and essentially we're hoping that it was going to be powered by one man that operated an engine on the Windsor side. But the fact of the matter being that there were so many struggles in this construction um, made it that it, it took several weeks to actually get this cableway constructed. The other preliminary construction included the construction of two concrete abutments and four pedestals. Soft shell rock cropping out was found under the abutment on the west side of the river. And the workers excavated through about 12 feet of soft shale to unearth a hard rock bottom surface to place the concrete on. This allowed the workers to build up the concrete structure to work at the proper level of elevation. 30 feet each direction from the center of the abutment was a concrete pedestal. These concrete pedestals allowed for support of the suspension bridge, which I'll talk about later. A major issue during the preliminary construction was the bedrock estimations. I mentioned the estimates being wrong, and, and this is kind of where I'm getting into it here. Um, the bedrock estimations were completed by Messrs. McDonald and Company of Halifax. They operated on Barrington Street under the authority of Mr. A.G. A. G. Farlane. Some of the estimations were inaccurate, which in turn made the construction more difficult and more time consuming than expected. This raised the cost of completing the piers, which were already estimated at $100,000. All 
I'm a source person. Um, so I have quite a few Toronto Daily newspaper articles um, scattered into this presentation. Um, this is one from the 21st of March, 1899. And it's news that the New York Engineering Contract Company, which was previously known as Soy Smith and Company, uh, was awarded the contract for the Pierce construction. It quotes, the firm is a most reputable one and the immense plant at their disposition will enable them to finish their contract by September when the Dominion Bridge Company of Lachine will begin the superstructure. They plan to have the piers completed by September of 1899. That didn't happen. So this is one of my favorite photographs um, of the Smith Maitland Railway Bridge for two reasons. One, it shows the men physically laying the rails right over top of the bridge, which I take immense pride in having this photograph. Um, but I also love the story of how I acquired it and how Jeff Ewell actually came to find it. Um, so Jeff Ewell is from the Old Barns area and he purchased a home that had a fairly old barn attached. And the old barn, he went in and there was an old wagon. He lifted up the wagon seat and there were all of these beautiful photographs that are 1901 circa timeframe. Um, this is one of them. So there are quite a few that are scattered through my presentation. Um, if they're from Jeff, that's where he found them, um, but they're super fascinating and I love the detail that's in some of these images. After the preliminary construction was completed, the construction of the six piers would need to be completed. Pier number one, closest to Windsor, was the first to have construction underway. This pier was very difficult to complete because the rock under the pier was very uneven and a lot of work was done to make it as level as physically possible. Since this was the first pier constructed, it taught the construction team some lessons. The entire construction process would be completed only during an hour and a half spans for each tide. This meant that the workers would have to protect the new concrete each shift that the tide would come back into the bay. To protect the new concrete, it was covered with a canvas, which was covered with small and large stones to not allow the force of the incoming water to damage the completed work. In order to be sure that everything was secure and completed properly, the entire construction process went rather slowly on Pier 1. Pier 1 was rectangular in shape and different than that of all of the other piers in construction and in purpose. Its purpose was actually to keep ice off during the winter months. The piers. So I just mentioned Pier 1. Pier 1 is um, the only non-pneumatic pier. Um, the pneumatic system, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, was used for all of the other remaining piers. And Truro Daily News from the 26th of April, 1899 has said, the pneumatic system of putting in piers has never been used in Canada. And this work will be looked on with a great deal of interest by engineers, especially. So this was quite an engineering feat happening in rural South Maitland. Um, I've mentioned this remote location, um, but this is a first for Canada, which is substantial. The next constructed pier was actually pier number six, the closest one to Truro. It was the first pneumatic pier constructed. This is the first location that the bedrock testing proved faulty. The rock type was incorrect at the incorrect depths. This led to George E. Thomas, the head engineer of the New York Engineering Contract Company to consult another company engineer. They came to the conclusion that the caisson would have to be built with a, roof, with a roof with two 12 by 12 timbers. When bedrock was eventually reached three feet below what was expected, the temporary roofing was removed. This resulted in more work and time than originally planned for. However, the engineers saw leaving the timber roof being exposed to the weather and weird climate as a potential cause for rapid decay of all of their efforts. The other tasks that made the process take longer on pier number six was the large boulders that would need to be excavated in order to properly place the caisson. It was not an easy excavation. I do wanna just explain how the pneumatic pier system works. Um, essentially pressurized pier, door on the top, door on the bottom, and they were operated by a lever system. So the lever system would open the top door, all of the men and supplies would go down into work, they would shut the top door, open the bottom door and proceed to go down towards bedrock. Um, the workers were not allowed to be in the pier at the time of the bore. Um, this is for two reasons. One, they didn't want to potentially have the pier being taken if they didn't pour enough concrete on it to hold it, which I'll talk about Pier 4 running downstream here in a few minutes. Um, but they also were trying to kind of work with the best safety equipment at the time um, and get the men in and out um, in these kinds of awkward and weird shift times. Uh, the piers themselves, the way that they were constructed, they were built in a wooden structure off site and floated into place downstream 
and the concrete was poured on top to obviously withstand the bore. Um, the article by Georgie Thomas, and I included a link um, before, and I included one at the end as well. Um, he's very boastful. Um, he kind of brags several times about, you know, like there is this challenge to get materials to this location. We're dealing with the Bay of Fundy. There was this huge setback with Pier 4. Um, and I'll talk about kind of how he downgrades uh, the severity of the accident that ends up in Pier 5, which is what I'm going to talk about now. The most troublesome of the piers was Pier 5. Pier number five would ultimately cost four men their lives, approximately 500 feet from the Truro side of the shore. Again, in this case, bedrock testing failed. The suspected material was completely incorrect and the bedrock was actually 14 feet further down than anticipated. Dynamite had to be used to complete this pier. This also resulted in more time during the construction process. On the morning of Sunday, August 20th, 1899, at approximately 8.45 a.m., an accident occurred towards the end of the night shift, which ran between the tides of 3 p.m. until 9 a.m. Weird times. As Georgie Thomas, the head engineer for the engineering contract company, would not allow for the men to be in the pier at the time of the tide. <coughs> Sorry. Oh. He would not allow the men to be in the pier during the time that the tide struck the sandbar. The men would have been nearing the end of their shift and fatigue was probably a contributing factor among the crew of 16 men. Since this was, the, was a pneumatic pier construction, it would rely on the air pressure within the enclosed caisson with the two doors operated by the levee system that I explained earlier. Due to some suspected carelessness from the opinion of George E. Thomas, both doors were opened, causing the water to come in on the men. Some men panicked, which is what is suspected to have led to their deaths. Georgie Thomas does not mention in his report about the previous damage that was done to this pier when it floated a quarter mile downstream. And after that point, from that point on, it leaked. In the initial stages of the accident, when the doors sprung open, water did come in on the men. Based on the witness reports given by the men inside, there are two opinions on how fast the water came in initially. And this was the science fair project that I ended up making um, a kind of model of by drilling holes in pop bottles. Um, this was cleared up by the statement given by John H. McDonald that was outside of the lock tender at the time of the accident. He said that the water began coming in rather slow, which allowed some men to escape up to the surface. Using the order given by Michael Bulger to operate the bucket, which was a transporting device responsible to transport men to the roof of the pier. So again, trying to get all of these supplies and men down within this pier that's trying to go all the way down to bedrock. Um, essentially, they panicked. However, the thought that the water flowed into the pier at a steady pace is inaccurate. The bucket was ordered to stop when it eventually crushed William Donegan, 28 years old of New York, between the bucket and the pier, killing him instantly. With a sudden jerk, as the bucket stopped, the door opened another eight inches, allowing the water to come into the pier much faster. While Daisy was crushed by the bucket, <laughs> William Donegan actually has an alias, which is on the screen, it's Con Daisy. Um, the alias, I don't necessarily understand why there's aliases for some of these folks, but uh, it does make for quite a, a fine when you're trying to look for inquiries. Um, while well, he was crushed by the bucket, the story's been told that two of the men could not swim and the other was holding on to one suspenders when they snapped. He fell backwards, hitting his head, rendering him unconscious in the flowing water. Michael Bulger's statement in the inquiry is as follows. Gave signal for bucket, also ordered it to stop. So as to guide the bucket into the shaft, then I saw all the water coming in and knew something was the matter. I went into the shaft to see what was the matter and was first man up, knew about how high the water would come, did not think men were in danger, end quote. Bulger was in charge of the crew that morning. He did not panic because he did not feel that any of the men were in any sort of danger. Normally the water would have come in slower and there would have been plenty of time to allow the 16 men to come out of the pier. However, the jerk when the bucket halted opened the door more, which allowed the water to rush in. Michael Bulger continues to say, went right back and saw two men standing there, head and neck above the water, but they did not come out. I asked for assistance to help the two men out. The two men were dead as a result of drowning, which I mentioned were the two that um, couldn't swim. Uh, the men who died in the accident were Luke Peters, 49, James Wilkes, 37, Con Dacey, 20, who was also known as, jo as James Donahue, um, and Con Dacey, uh, making the total death count in this accident four men. 
The bodies of the men from New York were sent back to their families and Con Dacey um, of Ireland originally is buried in Maitland on the Robinson Road. Um, another thing that uh, Georgie Thomas kind of forgets to mention, and I'll, I'll speak about it in more detail later, the lever system is being operated by a 16 year old. And the fact of the matter is there were, I mean, the men in the pier, you see 37, 49, 28, 20, was a 16 year old operating that kind of machinery, the smartest of decisions. Um, and I'll speak in a little bit more detail about uh, that 16 year old's uh, role a little bit later. Uh, Georgie Thomas had never lost anybody on his, any of his crews before August 20th, 1899 in South Maitland. And uh, while he says that several returned to work and the next day and work went off without a hitch, uh, the Charlottetown PEI examiner from the 24th of August, 1899 says nearly hundred men did not return to work as they had no faith in management. This is an article, um, one of the first ones I actually found um, from uh, Monday, August 21st, 1899 in the Truro Daily. Um, that it has the actual snippets from the inquiry in it, um, kind of in synopsis, very basic format. Um, and the inquiry snippets I uh, spoke about earlier, um, I will talk about it again a little bit later. They were in uh, the Nova Scotia archives and I've actually been able to see those pieces of paper um, that don't resemble anything of what a modern day inquiry looks like, um, but you kind of get a sense from uh, this newspaper article just exactly what information was being shared with the public. The inquiry took place almost immediately on a nearby boat. It was said all machinery was working fine, both before and after the accident. The foreman of pressure work on the west side of the river was Jerry Murphy. He recalled the water level being only six inches below the shaft opening on the top of the pier. The bodies of the men were located in the bottom of the caisson after the accident. The construction operation saw no changes in machinery and as a result of a thorough investigation. After the accident, nothing really changed, according to Thomas. Reports in a local paper state that four men did not come back to work the next day. Three failed to return because they no longer wanted to deal with the terrifying tides, and one Patrick O'Brien failed to return because of injury. Um, that, and that work went on the next day. And I mentioned earlier, the Charlottetown Examiner has a different story where over 100 refused to come back, um, citing the no faith in management. And uh, there's no mention in the inquiry about the age of the lock tender, um, who was only 16. And I now want to discuss Pier 3 and Pier 4. Um, so this is probably some of my favorite images um, from the bridge construction, just strictly because of the story that goes with Pier 4. Um, I'll discuss Pier 3 first because it was rather uneventful. Um, but Pier 4 uh, definitely has some interesting stories to be, to be told. So Pier 3 would be considered the least troublesome. It was not an easy construction, although more knowledge was gained from the beginning of the construction to know what was to expect going forward. Since Pier number 5 caused issues, George E. Thomas decided to develop a stronger engineering construction on both Pier 3 and Pier 4. This was completed by adding extra timber, rods and bolts, attaching them to the working chamber of the caisson. The final pier to be constructed will be pier number four. The pier was not completed without issues. The final pier was named after the chief engineer on the Midland Railway line, nicknamed Z.I. Fowler. This pier was constructed roughly in the middle of the bay, considered by many to be the center pier, which is one that has probably the most erosion from an ice decay um, out of all the piers in present day. The caisson was floated down the bay and into place without incident. This allowed for the construction team to pour the first significant amount of concrete to the timbers to prevent it from moving during the tide. At this point in the season, the tides are relatively short and it required two daylight tides to secure the caisson. All the concrete that should have been added to the caisson was added and the caisson was in the exact same spot anticipated after the night tide. On the morning tide, the crew watched on as it was beginning to settle into position. Unfortunately, it did not do what the crew had wanted it to do. The caisson overturned, actually causing it to float downstream, which is the middle image there. You're seeing it float down the Shubanaki River. This resulted in the crew going out into the bay with guide wires and a tugboat to try and retrieve it and pull it back to shore. Despite the challenge of actually retrieving it and the struggle that the crew went through to get it back, it suffered minimal damages. 
After repairing the damages done, it was placed properly without issues. However, the crew suffered another problem. The concrete would constantly be washed away with the tide, losing another day's work. The canvas and rock tactic was abandoned and woolen fabric was used. This proved to be much more intelligent and much more successful. Um, this is the record of the fifth death um, on the actual Shubenacadie uh, South Maitland Bridge. Um, it's the record for George Mercer, who was from Newfoundland. Uh, it's believed he actually died prior to the accident um, that happened with the four men that I discussed earlier, but there's not as much information on George Mercer. Um, this was recorded in the Evening Telegram in Newfoundland on the 27th of June, 1899, um, where George Mercer was from and just explaining uh, what they believed to have happened to him. So he was wheeling rocks to a scow, scow being the large boats that were used um, during this construction process, and the current swept him from sight um, after he fell into the bay, and his body was never recovered. And so unfortunately, this is another clear indicator of the strength of the Shubenacadie River and the Bay of Fundy tides. Um, they did actually erect a stone, and I have a photo of it here shortly, um, for George, George Mercer on the Green Oak side or Truro side um, of the bay. Um, I have a photograph of it as well. Again, kind of blending my, my loves of railway history and cemeteries. Um, it was one of the first things I went hunting for um, as a kid. Um, there is also kind of an urban legend and I call it that urban legend story, um, folklore, if you will, um, that was told to me by Johnny Camo who was a B&B foreman on the DAR since the mid 1970s. And he was always told that an employee actually fell into the sixth pier and was never recovered. He had a prayer said for him by the local priest and was left inside the pier. Donnie was always told that you could see a piece of wood sticking out of the pier and that's where they say is the wheelbarrow handle. So it was speculated that he was Chinese. I have found no records of any such of these encounters. However, there are some parallels in this story that, that Donnie has shared with me and the scenario with Mercer. Um, while he didn't fall into a pier, he fell while working on the piers um, and he was wheeling a wheelbarrow. So sometimes these stories kind of get told um, as a way to hopefully remember the truth. Um, and I haven't found any evidence actually um, of any uh, Chinese workers working on this particular bridge. So I mentioned um, my fascination with cemeteries. Um, so George Mercer's stone is the one on the right there. Um, and the left and the center are the burial site for Con Dacey um, on the Robinson Road in Maitland. The stone indicates itself that it was paid for by uh, the engineering contract company's men. Um, and it's quite a beautiful stone. This article um, from the weekly record um, from July of 1979 shows the construction of the road bridge, which is the Clarence L. Goss Bridge. I'll talk about that in quite a bit of detail here in a few minutes. Um, but it shows the proximity of the railway bridge really, really nicely. So for those of you who haven't been in the area um, before, you can drive along the road bridge and very, very clearly see um, the remains of the railway bridge. Um, this article also indicates that, uh, and it's quoted, four men were drowned in a caisson by the carelessness of a locked tender. Um, so this concept of carelessness keeps coming up. The spans. So the spans, after the completion of the piers, the spans would be constructed and placed one by one. One span weighed between 160 and 200 tons. The spans were made out of steel, making them extremely heavy. They were constructed on land and floated into position on boats, those scows that I was talking to you about, to be placed on the tops of the piers. The bridge contained five spans. They would be floated about 1,100 feet to their destination, and each span required about 18 people to place using the scows. A scow normally measured about 80 feet in length to about three feet in width. And there you see a span being floated into position. Um, this is, uh, again, one of those beautiful photographs from Jeff Ewell. As is this one. The remainder of the line was completed in time to see the floating in of the first span. And many trains were already running over each end of the line going to the Shubenacadie River. Not so remote anymore. A train of people arrived to see the first span being placed. However, William Stryker, the Dominion Bridge Company head engineer of Montreal, said the conditions were not favorable and for folks to come back tomorrow. 
So by this point, William Stryker had been with the company for five years and trains were brought in to see the process of the spans being placed from both the Windsor side and the Truro side. And as he promised, the span, first span was placed the next day, which was July 29th, 1901. The second was placed on August 14th, 1901, and the final span was placed August 28th, 1901. The placement of the final span was the only one that suffered an unfortunate mishap that could have caused a problem. During the duration of the placement, the cable snapped and the tugboat Bessie came to the rescue of the crew and controlled the unhooked cable. So I have the pop can there for size comparison. Um, this was gifted to me by Andrew Blackburn. And what it actually is, it's a bridge pin that was used to connect those very, very large spans uh, to the actual piers. So similar how you would think of a railway spike, um, these are on a much larger scale and I can promise you a much heavier scale. Um, <laughs> I, I tell you a story about how I got a flat tire um, trying to get it home, um, but uh, it's definitely an interesting piece um, that was used to hold those, those two very important uh, structures together. This is a really, really nice photo as well um, from Jeff Yule. I really, really enjoy it because of the fact that it shows so much going on at the bridge site, like the boats, the buildings. You can really see how the spans have been placed in and it's at high tide. So it's quite an, a beautiful photograph. And there it's completed and in color. <laughs> um, I also really enjoy the fact um, and kind of maybe the irony that there's a farm in the background of this photograph. Um, and the reason why I say that is because a lot of the communities that this line connected were very, very rich in agricultural resources, um, natural resources such as minerals like gypsum, timber, lumber. Um, and so it's really essential to me that uh, it's kind of recognized that these were connecting the little guys um, in rural Nova Scotia, so to speak. This is a blueprint that uh, I actually found um, while I was working with East Hans Municipality and their records management. Um, and they came up to me and said, do you want a copy of it? And I'm like, you have railway bridge information for me? Um, and a very excited uh, Holly ran down the hallway. Um, this blueprint is from 1911 from the Dominion Bridge Company. And it's actually when they modified the bridge. Um, so at one point it was a drawbridge. So it actually had the ability to raise for ships to go underneath, um, obviously being close to the Maitland community of ship for shipping um, and the famous Shibby Canal lock system. Um, it was only used the twice, um, but they decided that they wanted to modify it slightly. So they modified it to a swing bridge in 1911, and these are part of the blueprints from that procedure. Um, the swing was never used. So there's a lot of, I've had a lot of discussion with different folks about how the swing and the draw actually worked. And other than having these blueprints, there's not a whole lot of people that I've found records of them recording how it's been used or that they've seen it used. Um, and unfortunately, there's not very many folks around um, that have seen that uh, happen either. Um, so it, it does appear to be a bit of a mystery, but some of those initial concrete pedestals that I chatted about at the beginning, one of some of the first things that were constructed um, were related to the drawbridge. And the blueprint up at the top there shows the bedrock levels and the types of sediments that were actually found. Um, so you can kind of tell a little bit more information from um, the 1911, uh, kind of what reality was um, off of the estimates there. And they're very technical drawings and this is only one of them. I found several of them there on huge pieces of paper, um, but they're in amazing condition. So the usage of the bridge, um, the bridge was completed October 9th, 1901, and a train traveled over the next day full of Christmas shoppers heading to Truro. Um, this is one of the very few photographs of trains actually on the bridge. It was a postcard. They're not very common, um, but uh, it is something that I, I get really excited when I see the bridge in actual use. Ice guards would be on the bridge's piers in the wintertime to protect it against the ice damage, and they've not been on there since the, the late uh, 1980s um, when the line essentially stopped running. The demolition, so just very, very quickly, the demolition of the line itself started in 1986. Ironically, it was done by another Montreal company, which has well done a venture. Uh, the inside spans were removed first, where they cut the spans in half, um, let them fall into the water, and then they pulled the pieces to shore. 
this photograph, um, courtesy of my, my cousin actually, um, <laughs> who grew up not too far from the bridge site, um, shows the metal spans have been removed at this point. The road bridge. I do just wanna quickly chat about the road bridge construction. Um, the Dr. Clarence L. Goss bridge took two years to construct. So both the same kind of timeline as uh, the actual railway bridge, very close in proximity location wise to the railway bridge. And in the article of the speech that Georgie Thomas gave to the rest of the engineers, the link that I've kind of come back to a few times, um, they're actually very, very critical of him. And one of the comments they have against him is that he should have done less peers. Um, so he did six. The Goss Bridge actually kind of took this as a suggestion and ran with two. Um, if you're from the area in South Maitland, you might not be the biggest fan of this bridge. I'm not the biggest fan of this bridge. Um, you can see from this picture, there's quite a dip in the middle. Um, apparently that's supposed to be there. However, um, there's been quite a bit of construction and, and work on the bridge in recent years. Um, and it is one that kind of did have, unfortunately, some of the similar incidents to the, the railway bridge. Um, so the same accident that occurred August 20th, 1899 in the railway bridge where the door systems opened, the lever system failed, water came in, um, actually happened in the construction of the Clarence Al Goss Bridge as well. Fortunately enough, there was no one in the pier at the time, um, so there was no casualties, but I did get to meet the diver who actually dove um, in the pier and fixed uh, the, and made the repairs that were necessary there. So the current purpose of the railway bridge. So this photo is from the edge of the road bridge looking towards the piers. Note how much ice is visible in this photo. Um, and this was on a good day. <laughs> um, ice buildup was substantial during and is substantial during the winter months. And there have been no ice guards since the 80s. And obviously now there being nothing, you can see the middle pier um, has eroded quite a bit in comparison because it's really getting the blunt of the bore on the ice. Pier one and two are now being used as a look off as part of Fundy Title Interpretive Center. Fundy Title is operated by the East Hans Municipality. And this is becoming quite the tourist spot actually with the Shubenacadie River rafters are stopping to watch the Bay of Fundy bore and its strength, especially in the summer. When I took this picture, it was, <laughs> it was definitely not a tourist attraction, um, but it, it's beautiful in the summertime. Um, Fundy Title also discusses its location's connection to the Midland Railway um, in quite a bit of detail with interpretive panels and displays. So this article that I keep coming back to of Georgie Thomas, um, obviously he was the head engineer on the peer contract. This has him in a role of a certain level of bias. His audience is fellow engineers. While they're critical of him, they do have the similar training to him. Um, this article that he produced was read aloud uh, to this group of engineers shortly after the piers completion in April of 1901. And he's very boastful and very happy that these piers have finally been completed. Um, very technical writing. And he boasts that, you know, despite all these challenges and setbacks, this was an engineering spectacle. Like, you know, but he very, probably the biggest issue I have with the article is that he downplays the accident severity. Um, he makes it seem like everybody went back to work and, you know, in less than 15 minutes, everything was fine. Um, and for that, I kind of had a big hesitation. Um, while I understand it's challenging to judge Thomas and his actions of 1899 by today's standards, he does himself refer to the accident um, as a result of carelessness in more than one kind of comment. Um, and he's aware of the decisions or lack thereof of in uh, August 20th, 1899. And I'm speaking directly about the decision to have a 16 year old on the walk tender. So I mentioned that this lecture was kind of evolved from uh, a guest lecture that was given on ethics um, at Dalhousie. So I kind of have briefly outlined uh, the different ethical theories such as consequentialism. The railway benefited several farmers, lumbermen and other commuters and only five losses of life in bridge construction, two in the ballast train, therefore it was an overall net gain. Um, as unfortunate as it is to say, there was an obligation to keep workers safe and an obligation to hurry the job along, have it done well, have it done correctly. Um, but then there's also things like virtue ethics, like honesty and morals. Um, and this is where it gets really, really tough to take something that happened in 1899 and inflict present day views. And 
you know, what was morally correct? Like Georgie Thomas boasts about Con Dacey's military experience. Did that make him qualified to work in a peer? What was qualified? What was like, was a 16 year old qualified? Was he qualified to do that particular job? So I'm gonna read the, the tidbit that came from the Hel a Halifax paper on August 22nd, 1899. A boy in charge of the locks doing a man's work. Six weeks ago, the man who was tending the machinery at the top of the shaft was discharged and this boy put in his place. The man was experienced at the work, but he cost $1.75 a day and the boy got $1.50. The buckets were rushed up and down too quick and the man at the top is supposed to answer back. The theory which this man held as to the cause of the accident was that the locks were not tended properly and that the top one was opened too quickly before the lower one was closed. And that article is from 1899. So this is what other folks are saying in that same time frame about kind of this level of skilled labor. Um, obviously, there's information out there that George E. Thomas had more people not return than he uh, indicates. Um, and also the role of the inquiry. Uh, if we look at something like Westray that's happened more recently, I can access that inquiry and it's pages, pages long with expert opinions and you know, quality content from everybody and anyone that was relevant um, at the time. The inquiry for this, there's two different sides in the one inquiry, but it was conducted by farmers. If you look at the individuals that are named in some of the inquiries that were not the individuals at the bridge site, they're the farmers from either side of the bridge. Were they qualified to be part of an inquiry in 1899? Some of these questions I'll never know. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to hold uh, the papers from the inquiry um, that are at Nova Scotia Archives, and they're the kind of papers that give you chills. Um, they're no bigger than my hand, and they're just little scribbled notes from the men that were at the actual bridge site. Um, and it's one of those kind of things that will stick with me, um, having had those in my hands. Um, something that you can't forget as a historian and uh, these individuals roles were, were really significant. Another couple of quick points just to mention in terms of ethics, MH um, Fitzpatrick was a main contractor. He was a shareholder. Is that ethical? Subcontractors were also shareholders. Payment of property was not consistent from one end of the line to the next. Selection of property was not consistent. It mattered who you were. For example, if you wanted to keep your tree, you just had to ask versus some people who lost their houses, barns and right of ways. Um, and often the rail was to benefit shareholders and their other interests. Um, the exception to this actually was potentially Alfred Putnam um, as the line didn't go directly into the Maitland community. So these were some other uh, incidents and kind of events that could have been investigated for ethical comparisons. Obviously we have like the Boston molasses flood. Um, that was one of my favorite kind of disaster of the century stories when I was a kid. West Ray, the Boeing 737 Max, the Quebec bridge collapse. All of these can be looked at in similar ways to how I looked at this particular accident. And just to provide some context, um, these are listings of various bridge accidents, uh, their locations, the dates, and the deaths, um, numbers of those killed. The McDonald Bridge, for example, had five people killed in its construction. And I can't find the names of those who perished um, despite my, my best efforts. Is that ethical? Should we know that as people who drive over the bridges every day? Just how common were these incidents? Were they expected? Does that mean that that's something that we should consider when evaluating Georgie e. Thomas's work and the views? Looking at these accidents and deaths that I've dove into during this presentation, they're only a few in a much larger context. And so I think that's something to be really, really aware of that it was expected that there were going to be accidents of some sort of magnitude in the construction of this line. And I feel that that's probably why Georgie e. Thomas took the position that he took. Um, however, Still tragic nonetheless, and still five men's lives, um, seven if we count the entire line. I do have some links with some additional information. So I've taken a lot of this information um, in the preliminary stages from the JJ Taylor article, which can be found at that link. Um, and obviously I've spoke quite a bit about Georgie e. Thomas's work and there's a couple links there to the Gosbridge information. 
So I will try and maybe share these um, through email with anybody that's interested, uh, just so that you can easily click on them. They're very, the, especially the top two, they're very technical journals, um, but they're quite interesting if this is something that interests you. And I'm open for questions. Oh, that was fascinating, Holly. And uh, it's really lovely that you had a chance to, you know, to look at some of the, the considerations of building the bridge there in the first place. Um, I don't know if we have any questions yet, but do you know um, whether the bridge was located there? I mean, you, you sort of made some reference to, um, you know, to possible alternative locations, but was there any suggestion that there were conflicts of interest in locating it there or it was just, they just didn't know what they were dealing with? Yeah, so um, they considered all the options for building at the South Maitland Bridge, both constructing it and not constructing it. Um, and in the end, that $4,000 bonus that Clifton gave um, really kind of swindled the deal to make them make the crossing and to go in through Clifton. Um, it was a lot of money, right? Like the whole point of this construction and the whole point of this line was to try and connect these little rural kind of off the grid farmers, agricultural properties um, to try and really make them accessible. And by going where there was already an existing rail such as to Stewiak or to Brookfield, while it would have connected a couple inner communities, it wouldn't have connected necessarily all of the shareholders or all of the people that kind of had this monetary influence um, in the Midland Railway Company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing I was curious about, so the, this pneumatic system, so it was kind of like an airlock. So the men literally went into this airlock and, uh, you know, it's pretty poignant, as you say, that, you know, they just handed the job to a, a young boy who was cheaper. And it sounds like there was a failure of the protocol. So they, there was supposed to be a signal that the door, you know, the doors are open, doors are shut. Yeah. And it's, it's really kind of, uh, <laughs> Eve, that's a good question. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the uh, It's really unfortunate that the 16 year old was kind of in that position too, because I feel now like he's potentially a scapegoat um, for this kind of situation. And like, how common was it that 16 year olds were working on bridge sites? I know 16 year olds were definitely working at that time. Um, would they maybe have been put in that kind of authoritative position? Probably not. Um, but again, it came down to cost, which sounds awful um, when it comes to dealing with human life, but um, it did actually... I mean, that article sums it up really, really nicely in the sense of he cost $1.75, he cost $1.50. Um, it just kind of goes to the, the monetary measures that this company was willing to go to. And uh, not really. Um, so the Midland Railway shareholders actually, the Midland Railway company only really existed to get the line constructed. Um, so in, they oper started operation in 1896 as a formal company and completed the line. And as early as 1905, um, that company was actually sold to the DAR for more than less, less than half actually of what it costs to complete. Um, so they actually were losing money. But in terms of the shareholders' personal investments, it would be depending on each individual shareholder. For example, Thomas McMullen that I spoke about earlier, um, he would have had benefits from it for his lumber yards, but that not necessarily in terms of like a DAR or like a railway profit, because um, he wasn't involved in that after 1905. Yes, that was what Eve yeah. Williams was asking. And Linda says that she's seen Con Daisy stone in Maitland. And see that it was so the workers themselves paid for it. And do, do you know anything else about the families of the other victims? So or? I do know that the, the bodies were sent back to New York for the others. Um, and obviously, being the New York engineering contract company, they probably employed local individuals. Um, Con Daisy was kind of the odd one out. Um, I note that he's from Ireland and that. He didn't really have, I don't, I don't know where the aliases came from, but the aliases have always oh, here, been. Here. Um, and so the aliases being kind of that puzzling um, kind of tidbit, I've actually struggled finding the inquiry because of the aliases. Um, but I'm not sure as to, like where his family, um, if there's any amount of family left um, or anything like that, that would have maybe had a claim for his body. It probably would have been costly to send back to Ireland as well. Um, and yeah, ice guards, ice guards were installed on a seasonal basis, Linda. Um, and actually the Goss Bridge, if you stand um, on the lookoffs from Pier 1 and 2, you can see ice guards on the Goss Bridge and they're there year round. Um, but essentially they just look like diamond shape kind of blockers. 
Um, the ones that were installed on the railway bridge were much more detailed um, and extensive for each pier. Well, listen, thank you so much. And are you willing to stick around for sort of an informal Q&A and everybody yeah. you know, opens up their mics and this is, this is where we would have tea and cookies if we were all <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Thank you Can again. You the video? A whole lot. Yeah, that would be great.